Was, it was Friday. Hmm. Okay, we're on the air again. Uh, okay, so to begin with, are there any questions? Okay, where we're supposed to be is uh, you're working on homework five. Uh, did I give a due date for that? Was it uh, Thursday? Did I say Thursday? What? Wednesday. Wednesday. Did I say Wednesday? Yeah, okay. Okay, but nominally it's due Wednesday. And then homework number six, we need some new stuff for, and that's what I'm going to start discussing today. And then the uh, final take-home exam. The plan is it's supposed to be like a homework problem, but I don't know what it's going to be yet, and that depends on how far we get. I have something in my mind, but, but it may not be realistic in terms of the amount that we cover. We have about eight more lectures here, I think, something like that. So are there, is there any, are there any questions about homework uh, five? Okay, should be, should not be hard. Okay, so I want to start talking about uh, some mathematics that we need in order to be able to handle, uh, in particular, the MG1Q. That is uh, the case where we have non-exponential service times and we don't have insensitivity, so the service times matter. And so I'm going to start on page 2.4 with, uh, excuse me, section 2.4, page 96. So this is page 96. So it's section 2.4, probability generating functions. Probability generating. And uh, this subject, probability generating functions, uh, might not be new to you, although maybe the terminology is. If you're a double E, then probability generating functions are what are called uh, Z transforms. Almost the same thing. <clears throat> you double E? No. OK. So the idea is this. Um, suppose you have an integer valued random variable, non negative integer valued random variable. So it takes values, probabilities. <clears throat> so we'll call them. P0, P1, P2, and so forth. So if I want to define the uh, distribution, the probability mass function of such a random variable, in general, I have an infinite number of these probabilities to give. And that defines everything there is to know about it. So what I want to do is I want to change the form of the information. It's a transform. And so I'll call the uh, transform G of Z. I guess G stands for generating function. And the idea is that I take these probabilities and I uh, write it this way. It's a summation of p sub j, z to the j, as j runs from 0 to infinity. In other words, it's uh, p0, z to the 0, which is 1, plus p1, z, plus p2, z squared, and so forth. Now, you might say, so what? What's the point of that? And the point is, that the information has changed from a form in which you have this set of numbers, these probabilities, to another form in which you have a function of z. And it turns out that in many important cases, you can actually sum this series and get a simple function. And then it turns out that there are lots of uh, interesting properties, and um, uh, some of them are very useful, some very, very helpful. So for example, so here's a simple example. This is, uh, suppose that uh, we have a Bernoulli variable. So here's an example. All right, so this is a dumb example. Bernoulli variable, then the random variable takes two values. So the probability that it takes the value 0, let's call that q, and the probability that it takes the value 1, let's call that p. p plus q equals 1. So what would the generating function be? The generating function would be, well, p0 is q, p1 is p, so it would be q plus pz. So you'd say, what's the point of that? And at the moment, there's no point. It just illustrates it. A better illustration is where the uh, random variable, so here's example 1, let's say. 
So example two. Suppose that x has a uh, Poisson distribution. So in the book, I call that, uh, all right, I said this. The probability that the random variable n of t equals j is equal to lambda t to the j over j factorial e to the minus lambda t for j equals 0, 1, and so forth. So this is the probability that in a, uh, <coughs> uh, a Q with Poisson arrivals, that in an interval of length t, exactly j customers arrive. OK, now we could find the generating function of this distribution. It would be this. g of z is equal to the summation of lambda t to the j over j factorial e to the minus lambda t times z to the j. That's the definition. Then what I would do is I want to sum this series. So the point is that I'm going to be able to sum the series, and instead of having a, an infinite sequence of these probabilities, I'm going to have a single function, a single analytic function. So when I sum the series, what I get is this. I'll take the e to the minus lambda t outside the summation sign, and then I'll have the sum as j runs from 0 to infinity. And I'm going to take the z to the j and combine it with the lambda t to the j. So that's going to give me lambda t z to the j over j factorial. And then, so let me come up here. I don't need to keep this here anymore. OK, so coming up here, now I'm going to sum that series. So I have e to the minus lambda t. OK, now, you'll notice this is just of the form something to the j over j factorial, which is the uh, uh, Taylor series expansion of, of e to the lambda tz. So that sums out to be e to the lambda tz. And then I can multiply them out, combine it, and what I get is e to the minus uh, uh, lambda t 1 minus z. OK, is that right? e to the minus lambda t, e to the plus lambda tz. So what I've done is I've changed this infinite sequence of probabilities to a single function. Now, it turns out that that's going to have some advantages. Yeah, question? Oh, you got it. OK. Now, there are, are um, mathematical questions involved with this, like, for example, how do I know the series converges and those kinds of questions. And we're going to be doing things like uh, differentiating and integrating and stuff like that. And so the question about whether or not these operations are legal, we don't have to really worry about that because, for one thing, uh, there's always a feedback process here. You always have a check because when you get done, the answer should make sense. That's one thing. The other thing is that the stuff we're working with are always relatively simple, well-defined things, because the probabilities are always non-negative numbers. They add up to 1. So you, all of the um, theorems that say when it's legal to interchange order of differentiation and summation and things like that, all of the kinds of theorems that you would like to be true are true. So for our purposes, we won't worry about the mathematical details as to whether or not what we do is legitimate. It'll always be clear that it is. <coughs> now, obviously, if I have the um, uh, probabilities, then I can get the generating function. The question is, can I go backwards? And the answer is, yes. It turns out that the generating function uniquely defines the distribution. So what it does is it just changes the, uh, the form of the information. Now, you might think that. Uh, what you're doing here is you're going to start off with a set of probabilities, and then you're going to change the information in order to manipulate things. But that's not really what happens. What happens is, ordinarily, you have some kind of equations that relate the probabilities to each other. That's what happens when we have write rate up equals rate down, for example. And then what you do is, instead of solving those equations for the probabilities, you transform the equations, and that gives you some different equation for the generating function, for the transform. And then you solve that equation, and then you work backwards. And it turns out that that's a, sometimes an enormous savings. 
And so we're going to be using this directly for the MG1Q. So I'm just setting the stage here. All right, let's uh, look at some properties. And let's, re let's uh, remember this one because I'm going to use that as an example. So uh, in the book, let's see, this thing right here is equation 4.3. And then in the book, it starts talking about the uh, expected value of a random variable. So if the random variable is called k, which is what I call it in the book, let's look at it this way. Here is the generating function, in general, of a uh, uh, <coughs> non-negative integer-valued random variable. It's p0, z to the 0, plus p1, z to the 1, plus p2, z squared, and so forth. So if I were to take the derivative of that, then I would get uh, p1 plus um, 2p2 plus, uh, excuse me, 2p2z plus 3p3z squared and so forth. In other words, what I have here is the uh, summation of I'm taking the derivative now of this. This is the summation of p, j, z to the j. So if I differentiate it, I'm going to get the summation of j, p, j, z to the j minus 1. And then you take this generating function, you take its derivative, and you set z equal to 1. When you set z equal to 1, then what you're left with is the summation of j, p, j. And you recognize that as the expect j, p, j. And you recognize that as the expected value of the random variable who's, uh, that this generates. Let's call it k. So in other words, if I want to get an expected value of a random variable, if, it, if I have its generating function, all I need to do is differentiate the generating function and set z, z equal to 1. Similarly, you could see right away that if I simply set g uh, of 1, that is, if I set z equal to 1, then what I would have would be the sum of all the probabilities. So g of 1 is equal to 1. And furthermore, I could get all of the uh, <coughs> coefficients by differentiating and setting z equal to 1. If I said z equal to 0, for example, uh, <coughs> then I would get p0. If I differentiated and then said z equal to 0, I'd get p1, and so on. So I can get all the, all the p's back. And in particular, I can get the expected value by differentiating. Now, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Typically, that's not what I want to do. That is, I don't first form the generating function directly from the probabilities and then differentiate. Typically, what I do is I transform my problem about the p's into a problem that is a, a, um, uh, a set of equations that determine the p's into something else that determines the generating function. And then I differentiate through that relationship implicitly and get an equation for the expected value and solve that. And as you'll see, in many cases, this turns out to be much easier. This is a really neat trick. Now, I can get all of the moments by differentiating. For example, if I differentiate it again, then uh, um, I would get the, the second derivative. And the second derivative is related to the uh, second moment. And so in fact, if I worked all this out, and this is all in the book, by the way, so I don't want to write down major details here. Uh, there's a formula here for the variance. So this is uh, equation 4.8. And it's easy to verify that this is, in fact, right. The variance of the random variable k is given by uh, g double prime at 1 minus, uh, no, plus g prime of 1 minus uh, g prime of 1 squared. So this is the second, uh, this is uh, the variance. And remember, 
this is actually based on the fact that the variance of the random variable is equal to the expected value of the square minus the square of the expected value. So if you simply uh, recognize that this gives you that, then there's a formula for the variance. Question? Suppose I took the second derivative. Let's look at, here's g, uh, g of z. All right. g of z is equal to the summation of p, j, z to the j. g prime of z is equal to the summation of j, p, j, z to the j minus 1. g double prime of z is equal to the summation of j minus 1 j, j times j minus 1 times pj times z to the j minus 2. So if I set z equal to 1, this goes away. And when I multiply this out, I'm going to have the summation of j squared pj, that's the second moment, minus j pj, that's the first moment. And um, uh, this is the first moment squared. So it's straightforward to show from these, uh, assuming that, that this differentiation is legitimate, which as I say it is, that the uh, variance is given by this formula. So the, the point is that if I have something that defines the generating function implicitly, rather, as well as explicitly, then by differentiating through that relationship, and then setting the z equal to 1, I can get expressions for the variance, the mean, and other stuff. And I'm gonna, I'll give examples of that. Now, there's another uh, a very interesting uh, fact about probability generating functions. OK, let me keep this guy right here. So this is for the Poisson case. OK, so Poisson. In fact, maybe it's worthwhile using this to calculate the expected value of a Poisson random variable. Of course, here I have an explicit result for g, but suppose I wanted to calculate, just to illustrate, I'll calculate g prime of z. So when I differentiate, I'm going to get uh, uh, lambda t e to the minus lambda t, 1 minus z. Right? If I differentiate this with respect to z, then the, I have a product here of lambda t z. So that comes down. And there's my lambda t uh, differentiating with respect to t. So there's the lambda t from the lambda t z. And then the rest of it is just the original function. OK, so now I set z equal to 1, and I get lambda t times e to the 0, which is 1. And you recognize this as being the expected value of a uh, Poisson uh, random variable with parameter lambda t. OK, now, um, here's the other thing I wanted to uh, stress. Suppose I have two random variables, and I want to add them. So uh, suppose that I have um, uh, g1 is the generating function of random variable 1, and g2 is the generating function of random variable 2. So let me write it like this. g1, let's say, is a0 plus a1z plus a2z squared, and so on, where the a's are now the probabilities. And g2, let's call that b0 plus b1z plus b2z squared, and so forth. So uh, random variable 1 is a non-negative integer valued random variable with probabilities given by a0, a1, a2, and so forth. And g2 is the generating function of a non-negative integer valued random variables whose uh, probabilities are given by b0, b1, b2, and so forth. And suppose I multiplied those out, so what would I get? Well, I get a0, b0. That's going to be one term. Then 
I'm going to get A0, B1. A0, B1 plus A1, B0, Z to the 1. In other words, when I multiply these out, what I'm going to do is I'm going to then collect all the terms. This is, are the terms that multiply z to the 0. This is the term that multiplies z to the 1. OK, what's going to be the term that's going to multiply z to the 2? Well, a0, b2 plus a1, b1 plus a2, b0, z to the 2, and so on. OK, but so strictly by multiplying things out, I see that this is what I get. OK, but now look at these terms. Suppose I ask this question. Suppose I added the random variables that correspond to g1 and g2. What's the probability that the sum of those random variables would equal 0? And the answer is, well, a0 times b0. What's the probability that the sum would equal to 1? Well, it's the probability that the first one equals 0 and the second one equals 1, plus the probability that the first one is equal to 1 and the second one is equal to 0. In other words, you notice that the coefficients of the z's are the uh, terms that I would get if I took the convolution of the random variables uh, uh, that correspond to this and this. So what I'm getting is I'm getting, again, a generating function. And the generating function that I get when I multiply two generating functions is the generating function of the sum or the convolution of the distributions that the g1 and the g2 represent. So convolution in ordinary terms is a relatively complicated, messy arithmetic in which if I want to add random variables, what I have to do is I have to form the convolutions of the probabilities. That is, I have to take all combinations. For example, if I want to see the probability that the sum of those two random variables is 2, I have to multiply by all combinations such that the sum of those subscripts adds up to 2. What this says is that if I multiply two random variables, then the generating function of the probability distribution of the sum is equal to the product of the generating functions of the individual random variables. So convolution in probability space is multiplication in transform space, which is much easier. Multiplication is easier than convolution. So for example, suppose that I have two uh, Poisson variables. OK, so let's add up two Poisson variables. OK, so suppose that random variable number 1 has generating function g1 of z, which would be equal to e to the minus, let's call it, uh, I don't need the t. I'll just say lambda 1, uh, 1 minus z. And g2 of z is equal to e to the minus lambda 2, 1 minus z. So this is the generating function of a Poisson variable whose parameter is lambda 1. And this is the generating function of a Poisson variable whose parameter is lambda 2. Suppose I took those two Poisson random variables and added them. So as you all know, the distribution of a sum of Poisson variables is again a Poisson variable whose parameter is the sum of the individual parameters. We already know that. But we calculate that by calculating a convolution. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show that simply by multiplying the two. So according to my theory, the generating function of the sum is equal to the product of the generating functions of the individual random variables. So that's going to be e to the minus lambda 1, 1 minus z, times e to the minus lambda 2, 1 minus z. And now by ordinary arithmetic, that's the same thing as e to the minus lambda 1 plus lambda 2, 1 minus z. But what is that? Well, 
That's the generating function of a random variable that's Poisson. It's e to the minus something times 1 minus lambda z. And the something is lambda 1 plus lambda 2. So since this is the generating function of a Poisson random variable, that shows that the sum of two Poisson random variables, independent Poisson random variables, is again a Poisson variable whose sum, of course, whose mean, of course, is equal to the sum of the means. This is given in the book. This is equation 419. OK, so this is an enormous, in some cases, an enormous and uh, insightful simplification. Because what it means is that when I solve a problem and I get a generating function, if I can factor that generating function into products in which the pieces, the factors, are themselves generating functions, then what that means is that I've shown that my answer has the same distribution as a sum of independent random variables whose distributions are given by the generating functions and the factors. So sometimes this lends insight because you see um, relationships that you wouldn't have recognized otherwise because it would just be lost in an incredible amount of algebra. OK, but the way in which you uh, ordinarily use this is not by knowing what the distribution is and then going forward from there. The way in which you use this is you write down some equations that uh, describe the distribution, and then you use that to get the answer. OK, so here's an example I want to give. This is on page 32. So let's see. Get rid of this. All right. So we're on page 32. And the question is, let's look at the model where we have a Poisson process. The arrivals occur at rate lambda. And uh, let's say that uh, the service times are exponential with uh, parameter mu so that uh, uh, this is like an ordinary Erlang loss system except that I have an infinite number of servers. So I have a Poisson load, exponential service times, and what I want to find is the distribution of the number of customers present. Now we already know what the equilibrium distribution is, but suppose I want to find the distribution as a function of time. So now you remember that we had equations way back at the beginning, the birth and death equations, which were uh, simultaneous differential equations for the state probabilities. Um, and ordinarily, they're too complicated to solve. And ordinarily, you're interested primarily in the equilibrium distribution. So what we did is we took limits. We got the, from the original uh, differential equations, we got the limiting equation for the limiting distribution which were difference equations. We solved those. That was rate up equals rate down. And that gave us our answer. But now what I want to do is I want to get the complete solution. And I'm going to do it using generating functions. OK, so first of all, what's the original equation? If I remember correctly, it was the derivative with respect to t of p j of t equals lambda sub j minus 1 p sub j minus 1 of t plus mu sub j plus 1 p sub j plus 1 of t minus lambda j plus mu j pj of t. So those were the general birth and death equations for a birth and death process with birth coefficients lambda, death coefficients mu. And now what I want to do is I want to specialize that to this case right here. So that means that the lambdas are all constant. So here is the special specialization. Derivative with respect to t of pj of t is equal to lambda p j minus 1 of t plus, now, 
mu sub j plus 1, that's the aggregate death coefficient when I'm in state j plus 1. In this model, that means that I have j plus 1 customers in service simultaneously with exponential service times. So therefore, their aggregate service completion rate would be j plus 1 times mu, where mu is the parameter of the exponential service time of each individual customer. So mu sub j plus 1 would be j plus 1 times mu. There's my p sub j plus 1. Minus lambda j, let's see, I think I'll write it out, minus lam lambda j is lambda now. So it's lambda pj of t minus j mu pj of t. So these equations, one for each value of j, an infinite number of them, represent the state probabilities as a function of time in this model. And those equations that I wrote out, that's 420 in the textbook. So now I'm going to solve these equations using generating functions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define p of zt. This is the generating function. p of zt is equal to the summation of p j of t z to the j as j runs from 0 to infinity. So the z is the dummy variable of the generating function. And the t is the um, uh, time parameter. So what I want to do is I want to take these equations and I want to turn them from an infinite set of differential equations uh, for the p's into some hopefully simpler equation for the generating function pz of t. OK, so now what you do is you follow your nose. So I'm going to multiply through by z to the j and sum. So what I'm going to get is this. Derivative with respect to t, p sub j of t, z to the j, equals lambda p j minus 1 t z to the j plus uh, j plus 1 mu p j plus 1 of t z to the j minus lambda p j of t z to the j minus uh, j mu p j of t z to the j. So if I haven't made a mistake, all I've done is multiplied every term here through by z to the j, and then I'll sum. So I have here the sum over j, sum, 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 sum. OK, so now what? Well, now there's some obvious things to do. One thing is. I recognize that suppose I took this derivative operator and I moved it outside. Remember that I can, I'm alleging that uh, these uh, infinite series always converge uniformly, whatever you want, as nicely as possible. So that means I can interchange the orders of differentiation and summation, for example. So instead of the sum of the derivative, I have the derivative of the sum. So I'll take the derivative outside. And what that's going to do then is that's going to change this to the derivative of z to the of uh, this generating function. So here is p of z comma t. That's the sum of p j of t z to the j. Then I take its derivative with respect to t. Of course, there are two variables there, t and z. So I'll call that the partial with respect to t of the generating function. So this is a partial derivative. OK, what about this? Well, I could take the lambda outside the summation sign and notice that I have here a j minus 1, and here I have a j. So if I replaced this, if I rewrote this and made that a j minus 1 and took the z out that would then make this thing back to z to the j, then look what I have. 
I will also take out the lambda. So this lambda is gone. It comes outside the summation sign. And what's left is that sum. But what is that sum? Well, that's simply the generating function, p of z comma t. OK, now what about these other terms? Well, look at this guy here. I could take the lambda outside, and I'm left with simply the generating function, p of z comma t. All right, so that takes care of this guy. All right, now what about this? Well, let's see. I could take the mu outside, and then I would have j plus 1 pj plus 1 z to the j. So uh, that means that that is the same thing as, okay, so this term right here can be viewed as the partial with respect to z of p of zt with the multiplied by the mu. And likewise, this term over here, uh, if I removed uh, a z, so I'll write this as j minus 1 and bring a z out here and bring this mu out there, and then I'm left with z, j, p, j, z to the j minus 1. So that's going to be the same thing as minus z or minus mu times z times the derivative with respect to z of p of z comma t. OK, so let me collect everything over here and hope that I haven't made a mistake. I can uh, fix that by looking at the book. All right, so this should be written down in the book. This is equation 4.23. So equation 4.23 says that uh, the partial with respect to z of p of z t equals. Let's see, I think I made a copy of that here. It makes it easier for me, so I don't have to keep looking back at the book. Is equal to lambda z p of z comma t plus mu partial with respect to z of p of z comma t. Uh, OK, that's the first term, lambda z pz of t, mu partial of z with respect to, uh, partial with respect to z of pz of t, that's the second term. Minus lambda p of z comma t, here's my minus lambda p of z t, and here is minus mu z, partial with respect to z, of p of z t. OK, so where do we stand? What I've done is I started with the general um, birth and death equations for this particular model. Then I specialized to the special case for this particular model. Then, uh, now remember, in order to get the probabilities as a function of time, what I need to do is I need to solve an infinite number of simultaneous differential equations. So at first glance, it looks impossible. However, it really isn't because it tends to be true that the, that the problems that work out the easiest in one method also work out the easiest in the other method. But nevertheless, uh, there is some advantage in doing it one way over the other, and this illustrates it. All right, so right now I've got this ho apparently hopeless looking set, infinite number of simultaneous differential equations. Then I define the generating function to be the probability 
uh, with the subscript j, because remember this is a non-negative integer valued random variable. j is the number of customers present in this infinite server group. So I take the pj, multiply it by z to the j, and call that the generating function. So that means that now, instead of, I'm going to transform these equations for the probabilities into some other equations for the generating function. So that works in certain cases where the coefficients are neat. So that's what happens here. What happens here is that when I multiply through by z to the j in sum, then I can identify each term. And each term can be viewed then, ultimately, as the partial of the generating function with respect to z. Here I have the generating function itself. Here I have its partial derivative with respect to z. Here I have um, um, the generating function itself. Here again I have the partial with respect to z. And this should be a t, by the way, right there. That makes all the difference in the world, of course, because otherwise it would be an ordinary differential equation. That makes it a partial differential equation. So that should be exactly the same as 423. OK, now, there might be some obvious advantage here, because whereas before I had an infinite number of simultaneous equations for the generating function, I now have one equation, excuse me, whereas before I had an infinite number of equations, uh, for the uh, probabilities, now I have a single equation for the generating function of the probabilities. So the question is, is it easier to solve this single equation than it is to solve that infinite number of equations? And in this case, the answer is yes. And so now you have to um, uh, go to a, a junior uh, student taking uh, first course in partial differential equations, maybe a senior. And remember that when you study partial differential equations, at least from a, uh, uh, the viewpoint of an engineer or a physicist, the idea is that you look at all the different, you classify these equations, and then you look at uh, how to, uh, you, 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 in a sense, generate um, solutions for different classes. And this turns out to be one of the standard, easiest classes of equations. This is a standard form. Of a, um, of a partial differential equation. So it's a little bit more complicated than an ordinary differential equation because now the derivatives correspond to the derivatives of a function of two variables, and you have partials in t and partials in z. Nevertheless, now you could look this up in a handbook. This, is a, this can be put in standard form. This is an ordinary uh, uh, linear differential equation. I don't know. I don't remember the details. I just know that this is a standard one. So I could look it up in a book, because I have it in this book, or I could simply go over to the math department and show it to someone who teaches a course in partial differential equations. And he'd say, yeah, that's in chapter one. Okay. So I write down the solution to that. Of course, it's easy once I get the solution to verify that it is a solution. Okay. This is the way it is with differential equations, of course. So I have p of zt equals. This is a solution to this partial differential equation. It's exp, or e, raised to the power minus lambda over mu, 1 minus e to the minus mu t times 1 minus z. And this is equation 425. So my claim is that. If you solve this equation with the initial condition that says that p0 of 0 equals 1, then you will get this as a solution. Now, it's easy to verify that, because all you have to do is take this and plug it into this equation and perform the, uh, the differentiations required for the various terms. And you'll see that the left-hand side and the right-hand side are equal. So it's easy to verify that this is, in fact, a solution to that. Therefore, this thing on the right-hand side here, that is the generating function of the distribution of the number of customers present at time t in this infinite server uh, birth and death system. OK? So you can expand this. Now, you take a look at this, because remember, this is a, a, a textbook problem for the purpose of uh, um, Illustration. Okay, so I take a look at this and I see, but look at this. 
This is in the form e to the minus something times 1 minus z. So therefore, this is the generating function of a Poisson variable whose parameter is the thing that I have in the braces here. So immediately, I can write down the answer. The solution to those differential equations, that the infinite number of ordinary differential equations, is this. P j of t equals. All right, so it's going to be a Poisson distribution whose parameter is that. So it's going to be lambda over mu times 1 minus e to the minus mu t to the j over j factorial e to the minus lambda over mu 1 minus e to the minus mu t for every value of j. In other words, that is the generating function of that, because I recognize that this generates a Poisson variable, because it's of the form we saw before, e to the minus something times 1 minus z. And remember, the, um, I'm claiming that the inverse is unique. That is, just as the probabilities define the generating function, so you can go backwards, the generating function defines the probabilities. So there's our answer. Now, we could also now take this answer and plug it into here and verify that, in fact, it satisfies the differential equations. But I got this answer very neatly, because all I had to do once I did this simple change from the differential equations to the generating function is recognize that this equation that defines the generating function is a standard uh, equation whose solution I can write down immediately. Now, that isn't always true. In fact, usually it's not true. But nevertheless, it might be true in any particular case that the equations that I get after making the transformation are easier to solve than the equations that I started out with. OK, so there's my answer. Now, this answer has some nice, interesting uh, properties. First of all, it shows that we already knew that in the limit, as t goes to infinity, we had to get a Poisson distribution, because we've solved this problem before. But before, we solved it only for the limiting distribution. But now, if you let t go to infinity, that term will go to 0, and that term will go to 0, and you get uh, lambda over mu, or what we called a to the j over j factorial, e to the minus a, which is exactly the solution we already knew. But this is something even neater, because what this tells us is that if I look at this system at any time t, the distribution of the number of customers present is a Poisson. But that the parameter that defines that Poisson itself is a function of t. Namely, it's this thing right here. So if I look at this thing at any uh, point in time, the distribution of the state is a Poisson distribution, and the parameter is that function of t that's given there. So we have a complete solution here, everything you want to know. So this is an example of how the um, uh, uh, generating function idea works. OK. So are there any questions about that? Let's see where we are here. So now I want to go to the next uh, stuff that we got to do in order to develop the information we need to solve these kinds of problems. So I have bookmark here. And so now I want to start talking about Riemann Stieltjes integrals, which is section 5.5. OK, but first I ought to answer questions here, because maybe it went kind of fast. Yeah. Say that again. OK, the, I guess you're saying, what, what's the big picture here? OK, the big picture is that I define something called the generating function, which transforms the uh, information from one form to another. It transforms it from probability space, where the probability distribution 
is a sequence of numbers, P0, P1, P2, and so forth. And these numbers are all non-negative, and they add up to 1. That's a probability distribution, probability mass function. Now, I'm going to change that so that I have the same information, but it's in a different format. So I'm going to change it to some kind of analytic function. The way I do that is I say, if pj were the probabilities, then I'm going to multiply each pj by z to the j and sum it over all j. And when I get done, if I can sum that series, then it's a function of z. z is a dummy variable, has no physical significance. It's a transform variable. And that function, I'll call that g of z. Now, the theory says that if I make this transformation, if I change the information from the form of an infinite number of probabilities to this function of z, then maybe that's going to give me some advantage. And the theory says that you can see that if you tell me what the p's are, then I can plug them in here and I can find, may not be able to sum it or may or may not, depending on what the p's are, but this is going to give me some function of z. And by the way, since the p's are numbers that are always lie between 0 and 1, this thing is going to converge faster than a geometric series. So I don't have to worry about convergence, oscillation, any of that kind of stuff. OK, so if you tell me the p's, I can calculate the z. If you tell me what the function is, I can expand that function and find out what the p's are. So they're equivalent ways of, of uh, representing the information. Now, there's some advantages in doing this. One is, if I knew this, then I could differentiate it with respect to z, set z equal to 1, and the resultant would be the expected value. And I illustrated that with a Poisson variable. Another is, if I differentiate it again, I get the second moment, and it's going to allow me to calculate the variance. Another advantage is that if I wanted to add uh, discrete random variables, non-negative integer value discrete random variables, then the probability mass function of their sum is obtained by taking a, a discrete convolution. That means I have to uh, uh, f multiply the probability and add them up in such a way that the sum of the indices is a constant. For example, if I want to calculate the probability the sum is 2, then I would, if, the, if one random variable has probabilities given by A and the other one given by B, then the probability the sum is 2 would be uh, A0, B2, plus A1, B1, plus A2, B1, B0. So there's a lot of arithmetic involved in calculating a discrete convolution. What I showed was that if I take the two generating functions and multiply them together, the resulting function will also be a generating function, and it will be the generating function of the sum. And I gave an example of that by showing that if I multiplied the generating function for the um, Poisson with a parameter lambda 1 times the generating function for the Poisson with parameter lambda 2, the result is a function that is exactly the form of the generating function for a Poisson. But it has, in place of, of uh, the lambdas, it has lambda 1 plus lambda 2. So that immediately shows me, without any work, that if I add two independent Poisson variables, the sum must also be a Poisson variable. Now, the way that this is actually used, though, in queuing theory, although those are interesting facts that will come into play, the way it's used typically is that I'm going to examine some kind of system, and that system is going to be um, described by the probabilities, but I don't know what the probabilities are. I just know how they relate to each other. For example, if I have a birth and death process, then uh, this is the way the probabilities relate to each other. So I'm going to try and solve a birth and death system that is a particular case, namely the one where I have an infinite number of servers, and I have Poisson arrivals, which means that the birth rate is a constant, say lambda, the arrival rate, and I'm going to assume that I have exponential service times which means that there's an uh, 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 
a parameter mu, which represents the service rate for each individual customer. So we've done this a thousand times. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the equations. These are the general birth and death equations, and I'm going to specialize them to this model. Okay, so when I do that, the lambdas become constant, and the mu's are proportional to the state. Now, what we did previously was we found the equilibrium distribution by taking the limit as t go to infinity and saying that if we do that, this part will be zero, and these parts will just be the p's without a t in them. With a t suppressed, it'll be the limiting distribution. And the result is that we get, instead of differential equations, difference equations. And those turn out to have a nice solution. Rate up equals rate down. And we can solve those things by successive substitution and get the general answer. And then we took that answer and we used that to uh, uh, get the distribution in the case of block customers cleared and the case of block customers delayed the two uh, basic models. And what I'm asking you to do in your next homework is to do it for the case in which you have an intermediate case where the number of waiting positions is not zero, that's block customers cleared, not infinity, that's block customers delayed, but arbitrary n. So when n is equal to zero, it reduces to the Erlang B model. When n goes to infinity, it reduces to the Erlang C model. But that's only for the equilibrium solution. And now I'm saying, I would like to find more. I would like to find the solution, this probability, not in the limit as t goes to infinity, but for any um, um, finite t. So that means I have to solve these equations. There's an infinite number here, an infinite number of simultaneous differential equations, one for each value of j. So that looks like it's an impossible task. So now I'm going to approach it using the generating function method. Generating function method says, let's see if I can transform these equations, of which there's an infinite number, into some other equation or equations for the generating function of these p's. So I define the generating function. It's the summation of p sub j of t times z to the j. And that's going to be a function when I get done. If I knew what those p's were, those coefficients, put them in there and could actually sum that thing up, I'd get some function, some formula. And it would have two variables, z and t. So I call this generating function capital P of zt. Now, the rest is just turn the crank. What I say is, OK, I'm going to multiply this equation through by z to the j and sum each term. So when I do that, for example, there's the first term. There's the z to the j. There's the derivative. There's the sum. So I do that for each term. I multiply by z to the j and sum. And then I look at the terms. OK, let's look at the first term. I have the sum of the derivative with respect to t of pj of t z to the j. If I interchange the order of summation and differentiation, I take the derivative operator outside, then the sum is simply p of z t. And since I'm differentiating that with respect to t, that's really the partial derivative of the generating function with respect to t. Now, it turns out, because of the format, the form of these equations, that every term has a similar kind of, of interpretation. So this term multiplied by z to the uh, j and summed is the partial derivative of the generating function. This term multiplied by z to the j and summed is the same thing as z lambda times z times the generating function. So it's easy now to identify each term in terms of the generating function. So I did that, and then I just uh, rewrote it because you got too much stuff on the board here. But in doing that, this is what I get. The first term is the partial of the generating function with respect to t. The second term can be identified after this algebraic simplification as lambda z times the generating function. The second term on the right can be identified as mu times the derivative of the generating function with respect to z. The third term is lambda times the generating function. The fourth term is mu z times the derivative of the generating function. OK, so now 
instead of having an infinite number of simultaneous differential equations, I have a single equation. The single equation is for the generating function. There it is, p of z t, p of e t, p of z t, and so forth. And this is now a partial differential equation because it's an equation for a function of two variables which relates the partial derivative of that function with respect to one of the variables, t in this case, to the uh, derivative of that function with respect to the other variable, which is z, and the function itself. So, I've, so I have a simplification in that I went from an infinite number of equations to one equation which has the same information. The next question is, OK, can I solve this equation? The answer is yes, because it turns out, as I say, this is a, uh, a toy problem. The answer is yes, because this equation happens to be a standard partial differential equation of the type that if you were a student taking a course in partial differential equations, it's what you learn in the first chapter, the first week of the course. Because what you do when you're taking a, an applied course in partial differential equations is you're looking at the kinds of equations that arrive in engine, arise in engineering and physics and trying to categorize them and say, how do I find their solutions? Just like you do an ordinary differential equation, it's just one step more complicated. OK, so in that case, I claim that this is the answer. That is, the solution to this partial differential equation is given by that. Now, this is easy because once someone tells you what a solution is, it's easy to verify it's a solution. It's just a, 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 a freshman calculus problem to take this thing, this thing, and plug it into the terms and show that if you, if you did the operations, that the left-hand side and the right-hand side would be identically the same thing. So that's easy. So this is the answer. Now, not only is this the answer in that it gives me the generating function as a, in a nice closed form solution, but I can recognize what it's the generating function of. Because we showed that if we had a Poisson distribution, its generating function was the form e to the minus something times 1 minus z. Well, this is of that form. This result says that this generating function, if I were to expand this, generates probabilities, each of which is a Poisson probability whose parameter is lambda over mu times 1 minus e to the minus mu t. So therefore, that's the explicit closed form solution to this as a function of time. And if I now took this result and put it back into this equation right here, then the left-hand side and the right-hand side would cancel out, and you would show that it's a solution. So I solved what looks like a very complicated problem by the strategy of changing the form of the original equations that link everything together into an equation not for the probabilities, but for the generating function of the probabilities. Now, this one happens to be one in which everything works out neatly. That is, it's easy to solve this problem. It's easy to recognize this and therefore to invert it. But that doesn't happen all the time. Nevertheless, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. In queuing theory, the kind of stuff we're going to look at, it happens. Yes? Say that again. Yes. Yes. By knowing the original relationship among the probabilities, I can determine another relationship, a functional equation for the generating function of those probabilities. So I'm changing the form of the information uh, in a way that allows me to solve the problem. Now notice that I didn't, in this case, contrary to what's often shown in elementary courses, I didn't first give you the probabilities and say, find a generating function. I did it at the beginning as an example, but that's not the way it's used. What I did was I had some formulation of a problem that relates probabilities to each other, and I changed that to uh, another equation that relates the generating function to itself. And then I found out what the generating function is that solves that functional equation. And then that, I can now go backwards and I can find the probabilities. For example, I could have, even if I didn't know 
that this was a generating function for a Poisson. I could have taken the derivative with respect to z and said z equal to 1, and I would have gotten the mean value as being that parameter right there. So I could have gotten the mean value by differentiation. I didn't have to do that here because I could get the whole, the whole distribution by observation. So when this works, it's very powerful and very neat. But of course, it only works when you have the right conditions. Like in here, you had Poisson input, you had exponential service times. That gives you these equations. And it also makes these coefficients to be nice, a constant or uh, proportional to the uh, subscript. And that's what makes everything work. But in problems with structure, like you have in, in probability, in applied probability and in queuing theory, this often works. So this is a very neat, powerful way of looking at things. Now, there's a lot of, uh, of um, uh, mathematical questions that we're overlooking here, like uh, uh, how do I know that the generating function always exists? Because uh, it's a power series. And what's this reg region of convergence? And uh, how can I justify interchanging the orders of operation and manipulation that I have to do? But we've done that all along when we've uh, analyzed these things. And one argument is that since these uh, uh, functions, distribution functions, density functions, probabilities, they're all simple and well-behaved, all of the theorems that you would like to apply do apply. Second of all, you shouldn't take this, if you're, if you're looking at this from a queuing theory point of view, this isn't mathematics in which you start off by stating your hypotheses and then following the, the chain of logic um, without knowing where you're going. Of course, mathematicians don't do that either, but it appears that way. But here, the point is that what you do is you su assume what you have to assume about those kind of questions, and then you get your answer. And then you look at your answer and say, does it, does it make sense? Uh, the question is to whether or not the solution is unique. Right? You could ask, well, how do I know this has a solution? How do I know it's a unique solution? How do I know it's a probability distribution? Well, we don't worry about that. Because if we just assume that that's so, what we get out is we get a unique answer. It's a probability distribution. So we don't have to prove in advance that that will always happen. So we, we, we're respectful of the mathematical difficulties, but we don't let them stop us. Because if we did, we'd never get past the worry about, should I try to solve this problem? The answer is, yeah, you solve the problem. Then you justify it if necessary. Okay, so now we're ready to move on to the next topic. So let me just briefly say what it is, and then I'll discuss this in more detail next time. In fact, what I recommend is you read the section in the book, starting with, um, on page 192, section 5.5. I first learned about generating functions when I studied probability from the famous a uh, textbook by Feller. Uh, it's called An Introduction to Probability Theory and Its Applications, I think, uh, or Application. I don't remember. But in any event, uh, at that time, when that book was written, which I think was the 50s, when it was originally written, this was relatively new stuff. And Feller popularized this and showed that uh, if you want to discuss discrete integer-valued, um, non-negative integer-valued random variables, that this generating function stuff was the way to go. And by the way, I should add that, uh, let's see, the generating function is this. Summation uh, pj, or some coefficient, doesn't matter, z to the j. Uh, but there are other uh, functions um, that electrical engineers use in which instead of using z to the j, they use z to the minus j. So all you do to go from one to the other is substitute j for a minus j. I'll put a, I'll put a minus sign here to, or a prime. No, nah, not a prime. That would indicate, uh, I'll call it h. How about that? All I'm doing here is trying to say if you're a double E, maybe some of the people watching the DVDs or double E's should recognize that generating function is something that's used in signal processing as Z transform quite regularly. So they're really the same thing. Just, you go from one to the other by replacing z by one minus, by one over z. However, 
there is a difference in interpretation because we're talking about using this for probability. They're talking about it for using for something else. Okay. So now we're at 5.5. And this is on page uh, 192, Riemann Stilts Integrals. Riemann, R E I E M A N N. Stilchus, S T I E L T J E S. Stilchus, integrals or integration. Okay, so let me just give a quick rundown of what you're doing here. Uh, suppose I want to calculate the probability that x, a random variable, lies between a and b. So what do you do? Well, first you have to know whether it's discrete or continuous. So if it's discrete, what you would say is this. What I'll do is I'll calculate the probability that x is equal to, let's say, t sub i, and then I'll sum that over all i such that t sub i lies between a and b. In an undergraduate course, you don't usually write things out that way because it's, the notation is confusing and maybe more trouble than it's worth. But basically what you do in a discrete case, if you want to find the probability that a random variable lies in a particular range, what you do is you add up the probabilities of the all, for all the cases that lie in that range. Right? OK, now suppose the random variable is continuous. So now you make the, the big jump from discrete math to continuous math, to calculus. And uh, this, of course, is what uh, bedevils undergraduates taking the stuff for the first time, which is that if the random variable is continuous, that means that it takes values on an uncountable set. And so what that implies is that the probability that the random variable takes any specific value must be zero. Because there's no way I can add up an uncountable number of uh, positive values and have them add up to one, or actually any finite value. So what you're doing is you argue by analogy that I'm going to replace this, this sum by, by something that looks like this. I'll say that I have some function called a density function, f of t. And the density function is such that, well, here's the density function. So here is the density function of t. There's t. And let's say here's the a and b. And what you do is you say, well, I'm going to uh, uh, approximate each probability by the area under this little strip. And then I will add up the areas under all those little strips so that in the end I will get the total area between A and B. So the area under any one of these little strips at T is roughly speaking, using engineering speak, would be F of T dT. That is, the dT corresponds to the limit of delta T as delta T goes to zero. And so instead of adding up the, the uh, discrete values, which each of these would be, in this case, I'm going to now add up these uh, continuous values, or these uh, uh, uncountable number of values, which means that uh, the sum is replaced by an integral. So this is the case of a continuous random variable. Now, what causes people problems is that because the arithmetic here is different from the arithmetic here, that means that you tend to separate them. So in a typical course, you say, OK, first we'll consider discrete random variables, learn all the rules about them, then we'll go to continuous random variables. Of course, if you do this in depth, you never get there. The only way to do this that makes any sense to me is to sort of interleave them. But better than that, if it were possible, would be to say that, well, these things are really the same. The concept is the same. The only thing that's different is the method of calculation. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce what you could view at first as being a new notation. I'm going to replace this by D capital F of T. Now, capital D capital F. Capital F is the distribution function. And if it's differentiable, then this would be the same thing as the derivative with respect to t of f times dt. OK, the df of t, that is the density function. And then the mnemonic devices that I imagine that the dt's are algebraic quantities, not limits. And I could simply cancel out the dt, and I have exactly what I have here. So now what I do is I say, OK, this is the distribution function, this big F. If it's differentiable, then let's call its derivative, little f, let's call that the density function. If it's not differentiable, then in the undergraduate course, you don't use this notation, you go right to here. But now what I want to say is, well, why do I want to do that? Why don't I define uh, the differential as meaning d capital F of t means this if the derivative exists, and it means this if the derivative doesn't exist. So once you um, digest this, it allows you to solve all problems using the same formalism. The only thing is that when you get to the end and you have an integral to evaluate, then you have to know, well, do I evaluate this as a sum or do I evaluate it as an ordinary Riemann integral? And even better than that, some distributions, some random variables are mixed. That is, they're neither discrete nor continuous. Now, that always looks like a phony if you tell it to undergraduates because they think you're just making it up. But let me give you an example of one. We've already seen this. Suppose that I have uh, an ordinary Erlang delay model. The probability of waiting greater than t, let's say we had one server. Rho e to the minus 1 minus rho mu t. If we had more than one servers, then it would be Erlang c here. OK. Now, this, of course, presumes that t is greater than or equal to 0. If t is not, if t is negative, then the probability of waiting greater than t uh, is uh, 1. Because if t is a negative value, it probably wait longer than it is always, it's always going to happen. All right, the reason I want to write this is suppose I then wrote the distribution function of the waiting time. Well, that's 1 minus this or 1 minus this. So as we've written in the past, that 0 if t is negative, and it's 1 minus rho e to the minus 1 minus rho mu t if t isn't negative. All right, now, that's not a phony made-up distribution function for the purpose of an example. That's something that comes out of queuing theory. It's something that uh, uh, is a fundamental quantity, the, the fraction of waiting times that's less than or equal to t. Now, what happens if I draw the graph of that distribution function? Looks like this. Here is the distribution function. Here's t. When t is negative, the distribution function is 0. And then as you pass from this branch to this branch, the distribution function jumps. It has a discontinuity, and it jumps to the value 1 minus rho. There's the value 1. And then the graph looks like that. So this random variable is neither continuous nor discrete. It's discrete in a sense at 0 because it has a positive probability of taking the value 0, but the probability of taking any other value is 0. And the derivative exists here, and it exists there, but it doesn't exist at the origin. So therefore, the derivative doesn't exist everywhere. It doesn't have a density function. But on the other hand, it's not discrete either. 
So what is it? Well, it's a mixture. Now, if I use the uh, formalism of the riemann stieltjes integral, then when I evaluate something like this, if I follow the rules, which is what I'm going to talk about next time, then the result will be that if the random 